All right, hopefully everyone can just see my screen with the FAVE uh, seminar. Can, can I just get a thumbs up if you can? Sorry, is that what you can see on the screen? Perfect. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's really nice to see some familiar faces. So welcome back. But if this is your first time joining us, then welcome. Um, we are very excited to have you join us today. So before I get into what we're really here to talk about, I just have a few housekeeping things to go through and then we'll get to the main event. So firstly, we are very um, grateful to have uh, Phage Futures Europe sponsoring this event today. So this is a um, wonderful conference that is happening from the 23rd to the 24th of November. Um, and it's being held in Belgium. Um, and I'll put the registration link in the chat, but um, they have some really good uh, student prices and early bird prices. Um, and there's an opportunity for students to present a poster as well, which is um, very exciting. So I'll put that one in the chat um, in a moment. I'm just going to, sorry, make sure that everyone's on mute. Um, if that's okay, please. I just have some background noise coming through. Sorry, one a second. Perfect. All right. The other thing that we have coming up is our phage fund. Um, so this is a, I guess, a branch off of our phage seminar that we're in today. And this is purely just a networking, casual networking event. So pretty much what happens is you all join the Zoom room as you are right now but we've opened up some breakout rooms and you can just move between different rooms um, of different topics. So you can um, choose from something such as catching up with phase friends um, or something like lab um, troubleshooting. So if you have a specific issue, hopefully you'd find someone in that room to help you. Um, so this has been a really nice over the past few weeks. Um, I've met some really uh, great people. So if you're interested in that, um, the next one will be held in a couple of weeks and uh, Jess will be the monitor of that one. The last thing I have to quickly cover, and I'm sure as most of you know, we have International Phage Week coming up. Um, and I guess to celebrate this, the Ibadan uh, Phage Research um, team have um, organized a really great seminar for the second year in a row. And there's um, a great lineup of speakers, including our own um, Jessica Thatcher. Um, so I'll also put the link um, in the chat uh, to sign up for this event, but that's going to be a lot of fun. So if I go back to the start, what we are here for today. So I'm thrilled to announce um, that we'll have Bjorn Creel from um, Ghent University in the Briez lab um, talking today about FELP, which is a database that um, Bjorn has created with um, some other lab members as a database for um, phage lytic protein. So I'm very excited to hear about this. And just before I give the microphone over to Bjorn, um, just a reminder that this, the seminar will go for about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, there'll be, it will be followed by question time. Um, so if you have any questions throughout, please put them in the chat and I'm happy to read them out. Or when it is question time, you will have the chance to unmute and ask um, Bjorn all your questions. Um, following question time, if there is time, uh, we'll do some breakout rooms for randomly assigned uh, networking. So um, if you're interested in that, please stick around. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over to you, Bjorn, um, to start your presentation. Yes, thanks a lot. I will share my screen. All right. Can you see the screen, the presentation? Yeah, it looks great. Yes. All right. Uh, so welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending the, the, the FAVE seminar on FALP. And uh, thanks for the invitation, Stephanie. It's a, it's a great initiative, um, in my opinion. So um, uh, today I'll be talking about FALP. It's a database we created on phage lytic proteins. Um, and in the back, you see some beautiful artwork by uh, Lia Pantea um, from the book Thinking Like a Phage. Uh, and this artwork illustrates the two stages of the lytic cycle in which phage lytic proteins are involved. On the left, you might recognize the lysis at the end of the lytic cycle, and on the right, the infection stage. So phage lytic proteins, what are they? First and foremost, there are two types, and they do the same thing. 
they share the property that they can degrade um, the peptidoglycan of a bacterial cell. The first types are variant associated lysins uh, or uh, VALS. They have a lot of other names in literature, among which variant associated peptidoglycan hydrolases, structural lysins, stale associated lysins, and so on. Um, and the second part are endolysins. So uh, variant associated lysins, they occur at the first step, or you could say the last step of the uh, lytic cycle at the infection stage, and they locally degrade. I will maybe quickly share my pointer. Um, oh, wait a minute. Yes, so here you see uh, a phage attached to the uh, cell wall surface. And you see that during the infection, it has to inject its genome. And to do that, it has a virion associated lysin that locally makes a hole in the peptidoglycan that allows uh, the genome to cross the complete cell wall. Um, very impo important to stress is that this, the action of the virion associated lysin, it works from without, from exogenously. And, um, uh, some of you might know that there's a phenomenon, phenomenon called lysis from without. If, you, um, if too many uh, phages are attached to the ho same host cell, um, then the peptidoglycan cell wall will be degraded on too many spots and the cell will lyse before any phage can, uh, can infect uh, the bacterial cell. Um, the second type are endolysins. They're maybe a little bit uh, uh, more well known and they occur at the uh, lysis stage. So at the end, if all the phage uh, particles have assembled um, and, and the endolysins have accumulated in the cytoplasms, the holins form um, a hole and the endolysins reach the periplasmic space where the um, peptidoglycan is located and they they, they uh, perform a more large-scale uh, degradation of the peptidoglycan, which leads to uh, cell lysis. And very important, this is in the name already, endolysin, it uh, occurs from within the cell. So uh, why are we so interested in phagelytic proteins? Well, uh, it's because their main application is enzybiotics, enzyme-based antibacterials. On the video on the bottom right, if it starts again, you see some uh, bacterial cells that are exposed to uh, recombinantly produced phagelytic proteins. And you see if you just um, apply them from without, so exogenously, um, they lyse the bacterial cells and uh, they are, they are, uh, they're dead because of the, uh, they lyse because of the uh, turgor pressure inside the cells. It's an osmotic lysis. Um, and for gram positive uh, endolysins, this mostly uh, uh, works with native lysins. So just an EAD or an EAD and a CBD as is illustrated here. For gram neg negatives, this doesn't always work and uh, this might uh, require some engineering or some, uh, some tricks. Um, you see, to, and that is because it has to cross the outer membrane, of course. Um, you see here already that um, endolysins and virion associated lysins um, are modular proteins. So for example, here they have enzymatically active domains, EADs, the Pacman symbol. They actually cut uh, a bond in the peptidoglycan and you have cell wall binding domains uh, represented here by the hand um, that specifically recognize and bind uh, specific components of the cell wall. Um, and yeah, this, this modular architecture, it it's leads to a really high diversity in phagelytic proteins. And on the right, you can see um, a phylogenetic tree I created in um, 2018, I think. And it's, it represents all the phagelytic proteins from enterococcal phages that I could find back then. It was an early version of FALP and also from some metagenomics uh, papers. Um, and then you, you, at the end of the leaves, you see the modular architecture represented with some uh, domains and you see the diversity is really high. Um, in blue, I circled all the, um, the proteins that I could find in literature that were experimentally characterized. And then it's, uh, you can see that this is highly biased. For example, here, this group of chap domain proteins, uh, there's four of the papers that describe a similar protein. So 
you see the, the literature doesn't cover the complete diversity that's available in nature and in biological databases. And the ultimate goal of, of uh, people that are in antibiotics is to make enzyme-based antibacterials and get them to the market to actually treat bacterial infections. Um, and to do that, it's really important to make in the initial research stages, so where maybe many of you are, a well-considered selection of this uh, uh, natural diversity. Um, and therefore, that was actually the reason that we created FALP. So FALP, it's an acronym for uh, phagelytic proteins. It's a database of phagelytic proteins. Um, initially, it was created because I needed a lot of data for phagelytic proteins, but then um, we realized that the rest of the community could also benefit from this. So we made it into a nice database. Um, and that's a MySQL database. That's just the, the database language for the relational, it's a relational database management software. And um, the, the way this database is filled is um, I wrote a Python script that automatically queries Uniprot. I will uh, go further into detail why Uniprot. Um, and then automatically collects data from Uniprot, but also from um, other databases. Yeah, why automatic? It's because um, the biological databases, they increase every week or month or every two months because of uh, the major sequencing efforts. If you guys sequence a phage, there will be an analyzing in there. So it will appear in Uniprot or NCBI. So therefore it's really important that we make this process of collecting the data automatic. So it can be, the database can be kept up to date. Um, so how do we do this? It's not so easy as to just um, fill into NCBI the word endolysing or variant associated lysing because you won't find all of them because the um, annotation is not so good. Um, this is a common problem in, bi in biological databases. And the database, the biological database that is the best annotated and has the highest quality data is uh, Uniprot. Uh, so that's why we chose for Uniprot as a main data source. Um, and how do we do this in the, in the Python script to collect the data? First, we write a query. And this query, it's similar if you go to Uniprot, you can type in the type bar, in the search bar, and fill in some search terms. And the query we used, it consists of three parts. The first part is a taxonomy related part and it makes sure the protein we're looking for is encoded by phage. So one of these taxonomic uh, levels. The second two parts, they relate to the functional aspects of phagelytic proteins. They describe the function through a gene ontology uh, annotation or through a domain. Um, we constructed this, this collection of functional annotations so that as many phagelytic proteins are involved without uh, including other proteins. So this uh, involved a lot of manual work um, from me and, and Steph. Um, so this is the database. Um, as I said, we start with Uniprot. You see here in the central table, we have a protein data type that's based in Uniprot. Um, but FALP is a lot more than that. Uh, apart from the protein data, we also uh, include eight other types of uh, data, among which phages, their hosts, uh, which might be of your interest, uh, but also the coding sequence, uh, maybe experimental evidence, uh, papers that describe um, phagelytic proteins, 3D structure, uh, enzymatic activities, and conserved domains. And um, next to the data types, you see the logos of the, uh, the databases from which the data comes. So in the end, it's a lot more than Uniprot itself. And uh, it really integrates it. Note that uh, at the bottom of each data type, you have uh, a number. That's the number of entries of that data type um, at the moment that we published the paper. So now it's already a lot more. Um, and you see that, that it's not the same. Uh, so for example, we have almost 1200 uh, protein entries, but only 700 and a bit phage entries. Um, so that's also a reason why 
we uh, put this data in a database and not just in one big table because if you uh, would put everything in one big table and you will be able to uh, recreate that um, with a biomart tool that i will go uh, into detail later um, so for example if you have a protein with um, five domain annotations um, there's two papers about protein and and three coding domain sequences and you want to put everything in one table you will get one line for every unique combination so that's not an efficient way of storing the data um all right so i talked about the nine data tape the types in mysql we have even more tables to efficiently store and query the data so we have in, in blue, you can see the, the data types uh, from the previous slide. And within that, you see the actual MySQL tables. So it's a lot more. And MySQL is a relational database. You see that here because the tables are linked in specific ways. And um, that's also the reason that it's not so easy to just look it up in a table. You really need to query it and link the tables together um, if you want to look something up. Um, and for example, this the, the main table of the proteins data type is the Uniprot table. It looks like this. Um, the, the column names listed here are all data types in that uh, table. So for example, the Uniprot accession number, uh, the protein name, uh, the, the type, so endolysin or virin associated lysin, the UPI, phage ID, and so on. Um, so every one of these tables contains a number of entries so it's quite a bit of data um yeah so it's a mysql database i uh i reckon most of you are not familiar with mysql so therefore uh we created three or two in user interfaces to actually use the uh, the database and um we made them available on a website. The first one is just a basic table. It is really simplistic and it doesn't cover all, um, all the data available, um, but it's easy to quickly look something up. Um, so it's, it contains some part of the protein data type, but also from the phage table. Um, so you can, you can uh, search in here on every column or in the complete table and i will show you after this slide also a tutorial um, you can actually click on on the accession number of the protein and go to a general page on that protein that does contain all the data um, because we want to give you some more versatility we also created a biomart and a biomart is sort of like um a custom supermarket you can go there and you can first filter your data for example i only want um phages uh, that infect staphylococcus um, with a specific type of domains um, so you can filter the data and then you can select from all the the columns you see here you can select which data you want uh, you want to see in your custom data table um, I will also give an example of that uh, after this slide. And then the, the final uh, way is to actually download the MySQL database, install it on your local PC or on a server you have access to, and to actually make a, a query, to programmatically query it. But as you can see, it's yeah, if you're not familiar with it, it's not so straightforward. Of course, you can learn, but for most of you, it might not be the easiest way. But it is the most advanced way. And if you want to integrate the fault database in a custom pipeline um, this is the way to go then for example you make you can make a script or a pipeline in python and uh, access mysql to the mysql connector tool um, note that so for example this is a single query um, making this query that's what biomart does for you if you're using it uh, so now I will maybe switch um, to the web browser. So this is the, the FALP website. Uh, on the homepage, you can see some basic information. Um, here you have the, the MySQL dump file. So if you want to go and start with MySQL, you can download the latest version here. Um, if a new version is updated, it will also be put here. Um, 
here you have um, the, the basic user interface, so the table I talked about. Um, you can also see the total amount of entries. So um, when we published the paper, there were a little bit under 1,200 entries. Now there's 16,000. That already points out the, the, the rate at which this data grows. So it goes really fast. Um, so you can look something up in here. For example, uh, I want um, a stuff like Cocos page. So that just makes sure that Staphylococcus is in the page name. Um, and then you have some basic information. You can also sort on it. Uh, for example, I want uh, the longest Staphylococcal phage, uh, phage lily protein. Um, and then you can click on it and it will redirect you to um, this, the general page of this uh, Uniprot accession number. And here you have all the information that's available um, in, file, in the file database. So basic information on the protein, the protein name, the fault type. This is something that doesn't come from a database. We made, uh, we made this uh, classification ourselves. So if you're interested in that, it's uh, explained in our paper. Uh, protein sequence, some physical chemical feature in the prodomains that are here. For example, this is a phage tape measure protein. It has that as a domain. Um, I'm looking for the EAD. Here it is. Uh, for example, the PFAM entry for phage lysozyme 2 domain. Um, next, you have the taxonomy, both from phage and host. If there's multiple hosts, they will also be here. So you have the, the phage and the host itself, but also the complete uh, lineage um, of that. The coding sequences. Also, sometimes there are more coding sequences uh, available in Uniprot and um, also the genomic region of um, the gene encoding it. So it might be interesting, for example, often the whole holin is N-terminal, uh, not N-terminal, is upstream of the uh, endolysin. So you, if you're interested in that, you can find that here. Um, then we have the gene ontologies. So that's a standardized way of functionally making annotations of proteins. That is what we used to make the, the initial query to look for, um, for phagelytic proteins. And then in the end also uh, the enzymatic activity. And here it's not the case, but if there's a paper available, um, it will also be listed here. Um, so that's the most basic way. Note also that uh, you can, you always have links towards the uh, original source databases. So if you wanna go and look it up, for example here, or if you, you want to go to the Interpro database, you can do that here. Um, so the second user interface we created is the Biomart, um, and it consists of two or three stages. The initial stage we already skipped is the data set collection. You, by default, it will be the fault database, of course. You won't have any access to other data sets here. Um, and then the, the second part is to filter your data. If you have a list, for example, of Uniprot accession numbers, you can paste them here and it will only show you the data for those types. If you're only interested in endolysins, for example, not in the structural lysins, you can do that here. Um, these are the physical chemical features you can filter on. The phage taxonomy, so you can, if you're only interested in cardioviralis, you can select that here. Or the host, uh, this might be one of the most common. Uh, features of interest. Uh, for example, I'm only interested in, in Staphylococcus as a host. Um, note that on the right here, you will also have an overview of all the filters you selected. Um, I will stop with the filters there. And then you click on next, you go to the next page and here you can select the data you want. So the attributes by default, only the Uniprot accession number, the name and the phage type is selected, but you can also select the phage name, uh, the host species, for example, um, and all other data types. Um, if you click on results, you will get a custom table with all the data types you selected and in the, only the entries that, and that comply with the filters you applied. So in total, there were 16,000. Um, here, only 466 are available. Here, you can also click uh, um, 
you, you are redirected to the phage uh, lytic protein, uh, the, the specific page on that. Um, so if you're at this table and you want to continue with some custom analysis, you can also download the data here. And it will, I'll quickly show you here. It's switched to my other screen. I'm not sure if you can see this here. So it will download a tab separated values file of the data you just saw and that you can import in Excel or any other program uh, you want to continue uh, with. Oh, I lost my web browser. Wait a minute. Yeah, anyway, I think we're, we're done with the web browser. Um, maybe also if there's a PDB file available, so a 3D structure, you can uh, also see that on the, on the database, on the website itself. So that's it for the user interfaces. Um, we didn't just make the database. Uh, we also did a lot of analysis on it. Um, basic quantitative analysis, bioinformatic analysis, and also some interpretable machine learning. And that's all described in this uh, paper. Um, so I would highly recommend you to read it if you're interested in that. Um, and I will maybe quickly uh, show you some figures of the analysis we did there. Um, this table, it represents a table that uh, was published in a paper in 2013 by uh, Hugo Oliveira and his colleagues. Um, and it's on the bottom, yeah, it's not so readable. On the bottom, you have uh, all C cell wall binding domains and here all uh, enzymatically active domains. And here you have the genera of all uh, phage hosts. And then you see in the table, um, given that the phage lytic protein is uh, in, uh, encoded by a phage that infects this uh, bacterial hosts, these are the probabilities of a certain domain occurring. And then you see, uh, for example, um, that spe uh, specific uh, CBDs only occur in uh, gram positives, for example, the first ones here or even are specific to a genus uh, themselves. Um, on the right, you see another figure that's a core diagram that represents the domain adjacencies. So if you have a domain architecture um, with multiple domains next to each other, you see here what, uh, what's the likelihood of a certain domain occurring a C terminal of another domain. So for example, this represents an uh, uh, N-terminal and amidase domain and C-terminally after this, the peptidase M23 domain occurs. You can also see the repeats of cell wall binding domains. Those are the ones in red here. Um, yes. We also looked at the generalized architecture. So not looking at specifically it's an amidase two domain and then an SH3 domain, but really it's an EAD, a CBD. Um, and we plotted them here for um, different gram types of hosts. Uh, and then you can see that, for example, the majority um, appears to only have a single EAD domain, even in gram-positive endolysins, which are known to, uh, to mostly uh, contain a cell wall binding domain. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, another uh, uh, figure of these EAD only domains. Um, and here we plotted the length of the annotated single EAD and the total sequence length. And then you can see, for example, for the ones in blue, the gram negative, uh, the gram positive and the lysins and the myco mycobacteriaceae lysins, that there are always large, uh, that they often contain a large empty unannotated region. And this already hints towards the, uh, the lack of annotation bias. For example, if it's a really exotic domain, uh, it won't be contained in any uh, domain database. And um, there will appear to be no domain there, but know that this is not complete. Um, so there might always be unknown domains. So um, 
at last, I would like to thank um, all the co-authors of our paper. So Steph, uh, who did many of the analysis, uh, and then Michiel, Eve, and Wim, who uh, supervised everything. Um, and I would also like the uh, funding agency, FWO, and uh, all the other people in our amazing labs, the Laboratory of Applied Biotechnology, Biobix, and um, Kermit. And um, yeah, now it's it's your turn. It's time to explore FALP. Um, here you have the link. You can also just Google it or use a QR code. Um, you can. We also have a Twitter account for FALP on which we will update um, uh, we will post updates, but also tweet the latest phagelytic protein papers. Um, and then at last, if you have any feedback or suggestions, if you have questions or, or you, you have suggestions how to improve the database, you can contact us through the contact form on the, on the website or through Twitter, for example, here are our accounts. Um, we will do the best. Uh, we do, will do our best to, to implement your feedback, uh, but note that we can also not change everything. A lot of the data that's in there is, um, is in Uniprot. So if you come across an error uh, in Uniprot, you can uh, notify the, the manual curator, curators of Uniprot about this on this webpage. Um, and I would also highly encourage you, because if you looked in the beginning at the number of experimental um, evidence, so papers about phagelytic proteins, this doesn't nearly represent the, all the papers that are available. So if you publish anything, even if it's not about a phagelytic protein, but about another protein, use um, the Uniprot accession number in your paper. Um, so, that was it for the end of, uh, of my presentation. I would like to thank you all for, for uh, your attention and uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Bjorn, that was great. I'm um, seeing some comments um, in the chat from Emmy that it was an excellent effort from the Lyson community. So congratulations to Bjorn and Eve. Um, if there's any questions in the chat, please, Oh, sorry, if there's any questions, please pop them in the chat and I'll read them out. Or um, you can use the reaction um, function to raise your hand and then I can unmute you if you would prefer to ask your question out loud. Um, we have a question from Ermi. Is there any information on IP status of the license in the database? Um, no, that's not in there. It's also not in Uniprot. Um, the sequences available in FALP and also in Uniprot are always published. Um, any information on whether they are patented or so, it's not in there. Um, but it's public data, so um, normally you should be able to use it at least for um, research purposes. Um, I do know there's a website where you can like blast a protein sequence and, and compare it to uh, sequences that are protected by IP. So maybe that is an idea um, to actually implement in fault, but it's not the case yet. Thank you, uh, Bjorn. Um, sorry, just looking at the chat. Uh, do you, from, sorry, a question from Dimi. Um, do you plan for future improvement to the machine learning model itself? Um, I'm not 100% sure about which model you're talking. So we use the machine learning model to make the classification between endolysins and phagelytic proteins. Um, the data we used to train that, it, it was a random forest, um, we manually curated. So maybe if the, the the sequences available in FALP um, are increased there a lot more than we might uh, do an update. Um, so that will certainly be necessary. Um, if you're talking about the machine learning, the interpretable machine learning analysis in the paper, um, there are no concrete plans to repeat it. It's more about um, giving an example on how you can analyze this data and not really um, repeat this analysis every time because although it's it's computational analysis it still requires a lot of work um, to do perfect um if there's any follow-up questions please just put them in the chat and i'll read them out um, another one that we have here so very good work um can you support database api 
Um, that's not yet the case. And I will check if wait a minute. I think it should be possible through the biomarts. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. If you give me a moment, I will look it up. It should be possible. So at the end of the results page, you see, I don't know if you can see this. So you can download the data, but you can also make an arrest or so up uh, API available. I don't know if this is something that automatically happens um, or that we should still make available. Um, so I will certainly look into that. It's of course a lot easier to integrate it in your, uh, in a custom pipeline, for example. Perfect. Um, so I'm sure if you already answered this follow-up question from Ermi, but um, would there be a built-in tool in the database for structure pred prediction of the proteins? Since AlphaFold, this would certainly be possible. Um, I will have to check in because now the, the database is running on a server of um, my co-supervisor, Ruin van Kriekinge. I think it's to really integrate it in the website, um, it will require a lot from the server. But if I look at the um, alpha faults, they created the database with all predictions from human proteomes, um, but also from a certain number of model organisms. And there are plans to do this for the complete, for all of Uniprot. So then it will for sure be possible. Then they, the predicted structure will also appear as if it was a, P, uh, uh, as if it were a PDB, and then it can be viewed um, there. But to do the predictions ourselves, it's not uh, it's, it's not our, our plan, but it's certainly possible. Perfect, thank you, Bjorn. Um, if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat. I just had a quick one, um, and maybe I missed this, so sorry if I did, but um, is there any information in your database or room to put information in the database um, if people use these ender license in um, lytic studies and about their host range and things like that? About what the host interaction that, that the, a, a specific analyzing targets or doesn't target um, a new host. Um, for the moment, if I look at the database architecture here, so here's the table for experimental evidence. Um, of course, this only contains the, the PubMed ID, the title, not, not really specific um, interactions. Here you have the phages and their hosts. This is based on uh, what's available in the NCBI taxonomy database and also the virus host database. Um, you could adjust this architecture, for example, with an extra table experimental interactions. Um, if you download the database, you also have these architectures and you can add tables as if you please. So that's certainly possible if you're interested in that. Thanks, Bjorn. Um, just having another look at the chat. So we have another quick. Sorry, another question. Um, so annotated amidase of phages sometimes do not have lytic activity. How are they dis distinguished in the um, database, in your database? Are they still classified as ender license? Mm, I do recall a paper where you have a chat domain and an amidase domain, and then the amidase domain doesn't indeed appear to have um, a lytic activity. The domains annotated uh, here from Interpro, they're only conserved domains, though, so they're not experimentally verified. Um, we don't distinguish among them in fault. So yeah, we cannot give a guarantee that every phage leak protein described in fault will actually uh, give a lytic effect if you express it uh, recombinantly and apply it to, to its host, for example. Um, yeah, I don't think it's it's so so easy uh, to implement it, but that it's a good reminder. Yeah, certainly. Um, is there any other questions? Uh, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself, or sorry, put your hand up and I'll unmute you um, if you want to um, ask your question out loud, or please pop them in the chat and I can read them out for you. So yes, I just gave your um, the Twitter page a follow so that was good. Um, just have maybe that... also I, I can maybe give a little comment. Um, so I showed you some figures of analysis we did. 
Um, but if you were at uh, um, the virus of microbes digital meeting last year, you might also have seen um, some slides slides from Carlos Sao Jose, where we also used uh, his group also used the, the database um, to identify alternative translational start sites. So the the possibilities, yeah, it's it's yours to choose. They're really endless. Um, it was, by the way, a great ex exam uh, example of the the use of the database. I'm really happy that that people are already using it, and I hope in the future more will. Um, I see Urmi has raised her hand for another question. I don't know if. Yeah, hi. hi. Hello. Hi, this is Urmi. Uh, congratulations. It's, it's really a great help for all of us who are working on lessons, putting them all together under one mark. Uh, so I wanted to, I was curious that how will you update, like, uh, will it automatically uh, take in the information from the newly published license sequences and uh, publish experimentally verified or just the computational information. Uh, how do you propose to expand the base? I mean, the database. How do you mean expand the database with, with new updates, papers? Updates the database. Sorry? Updates. The, updates the, updates. the yeah, once the new, new sequences are added, how will they be added to the database? Yes, so the, the way uh, the, the database is filled is through an automatic Python script. So um, every time there's a unit uh, update, which is I think eight weekly, um, we plan to up, to run an update. Um, in theory, this is automatic. Uh, in, in reality, this still requires quite some uh, manual troubleshooting because sometimes things change. For example, the Interpro API might change, so some some uh, changes might be needed. But we could we could update it. Um, with every new Uniprot uh, release automatically. And if I, if I may ask one more small question, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I just joined a little late, so maybe I missed. Uh, is there any domain, like when you study the domain architecture of license from different uh, phages, different uh, bacterial phages? So uh, are there any patterns that you find like uh, in terms of activity or is it only structural analysis? I mean, in terms of if the domain architecture is modular or globular, so which of the enzymes are reported to be more active, et cetera. So, um, so uh, sorry. yeah, so I wanted to know if there is any analysis on those lines, or maybe the user can look at the information available and analyze for themselves. So um, the if you look here, so all interpro conserved domains are available. Um, so that includes a lot of member databases of Interpro towards specific architectures. Uh, we did some analysis in the paper, uh, in our paper. Maybe, I don't know, Steph, if you're there, because he's the one who did it, maybe you can comment on that if you want. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, so we did some analysis on the different architectures that appeared um, mainly to see if some architectures were uh, more prominent for um, for specific bacterial hosts. Um, we did a whole analysis trying to set up uh, something like a design tree uh, for people working towards enzygotics to be able to figure out which architectures to use or which architectures uh, occur in nature uh, for a specific host. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and apart from that, I think you can also use the Biomart to, yeah, just look for a specific host and uh, filter in architectures. Yeah. And, uh, I, I meant the correlation between the architecture and activity, if there is any. Yeah, it's not, if you mean um, uh, experimentally determined activity, as in, um, um, a person, uh, uh, a log reduction, or something like that. That's not available in the database, so it's not um, about actual experimental uh, data. It is, um, yeah. Of course, if, if a phage infects a certain bacteria, uh, bacterial hosts, we assume that there's it. It can degrade its peptidoglycan, of course, but it's this doesn't contain data yet on. Uh, Enzabiotics. So, if you um, exogenously apply them to the phage, um, 
it might be an option to to include that also in the future but of course it's hard to compare experimental data because you know it might be different conditions different buffers um different essays um so i don't know if it's the database would benefit from actually putting the data in there and comparing of course if they're described in a paper and they're linked to the uniprot accession number you will uh you will see it um in the experimental evidence table thank you very much thank you Thank you for that discussion. Um, is there any last minute questions? If not, we might move to the breakout room. So if people want to stay around for some casual networking, um, we'll open up some breakout rooms. But thank you so much, Beyond, for giving um, that tour of the site and of the exciting database. I'm definitely looking forward to keeping up to date on Twitter. So yeah, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for coming along and um, yeah, asking some really great questions. Thank you. Thanks Beyond. a lot. Thanks a lot for the uh, invitation, and uh, I would say it's yeah, it's a great initiative. Initiative the fifth the fifth seminar seminar. I'm sorry. Um, so I would say keep up the good work. It's great. Thank you. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, and if yeah, people want to stay around, we'll open up some breakout rooms so people can have a quick chat. Um, and yeah, we'll probably make about five minute breakout rooms um, and see how many we can fit in within the hour. So. Stick around if you'd like to do that. If not, um, please feel free to go on with your day or night, whatever time zone you're in. <laughs> Thank you for joining us.